welcome to the show. And today will be a little bit of a departure from the music interviews that I've been doing. And there will be, of course, more music episodes upcoming, um, but also more episodes like this that I've done and I'll continue to do. So make sure to subscribe to the show so you don't miss any future episodes. Uh, now, my guest today is Dr. Moran Cerf, and he has degrees in philosophy, physics, and neuroscience. And he's used to be, used to be what's a, a computer hacker, and he used to rob banks. And now he's into hacking brains, and he's used his understanding and deciphering of computer codes to understand the brain and crack that code. And he's doing some really cutting edge research with uh, brains, neuroscience, and dreams. And we're just going to scratch the surface of everything in this interview. Uh, but a lot of this stuff sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie. And Dr. Surf has actually consulted with Hollywood on movies and TV shows, including Dr. Robot and Limitless. So get ready. This is a fascinating conversation and prepare to have your mind blown. Please welcome Dr. Moran Surf to the Chuck Shoot Podcast. How are you doing? Wonderful. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Yeah. Well, I've done a, a little bit of research on you and uh, you're a fascinating guy. You're doing, you're studying some fascinating things, doing cutting edge research, but let's start a little bit at the beginning. If I could, uh, if we could tell people a little bit about your background with the bank robbing and the hacking and all that. It's so fast. I'm sure you've told the story a million times, but it's so fascinating. Sure. I mean, I, I think that no matter what I do in my life, I will always need be known as the former hacker or uh, the stories about bank robbing are going to be the first thing I'm going to introduce to it. So I'm owning it. Right. <laughs> yeah. I was a child of the eighties and as a child of the eighties, I grew up with computers kind of as they became a household item. I had one and I learned to operate them and quick uh, kind of cut to the chase. I became a hacker. So I, I knew how to tinker with the inside of computers. And it became uh, useful when I uh, turned 18 and joined the Israeli intelligence. So as, as an Israeli kid at age 18, you go to the Israeli army. Hmm. I was recruited to the intelligence and my skills as a hacker became useful. So for uh, four years in the Israeli military, I got to hone uh, those skills and practice them in a much you know, bigger setup. Yeah. Military so, budgets. so you're robbing banks. And uh, not only uh, through computers, but also you physically went into banks and robbed them. But it's it's part of the government. The government's hired you then, or who, how is this legal? Because you weren't actually breaking the law, right? When I finished the army, I started a company, and the company was doing the same thing as civilians. So then we would be hired by banks or by the government, the FBI, and stuff like that. And the, the way it works is that the board of the bank, let's say, hires you and says, "We want to make sure that our bank, our money's, uh, our clients' money is safe." So we're going to hire you a team of hackers to try to break into our own bank without anyone else other than the board knowing about it. And when you succeed, you tell us how you did it so we can actually change something in the security. So we would be hired to rob a bank by the owners of the bank, but no one else knew. So from the perspective of the bank owners, mm -hmm. it was legal. But from anyone else's perspective, this was a typical bank robbery. So we would come to the bank either physically or mostly virtually and transfer money from one account to another or change some numbers or show that we can actually get data from the inside and then help the bank secure themselves better so the bad guys wouldn't be able to come in. Yeah, so when you physically went in there, did you rob it with a gun or you just like manipulate the teller? Because some of the stuff you called the teller and you you asked for the password and they she says, no, I can't do that. And then you call the next day and you say, okay, good job, I'm the head of security, so now give me the password and then you tricked her. Yeah, so, so I think that uh, hacking uh, is a broad term for everything, from going into the bank physically and trying to take something, to going virtually, to phone calls, uh, mm -hmm. human intelligence, and so on. We did all of those. I think that the most sexy stories are the ones where we actually came to the bank in person and you know pretended to be bank robbers, old-fashioned. Uh, those were the kind of... We did it very few times. This did you have a gun, though, or how did you... No. What did you so, use? So I think there, there are some rules, uh, even even when you pretend to hack a bank. Yeah. Robin Tomek, some rules. So, so we picked uh, branches that have only one teller. So they want to be kind of, you know, a catastrophe. Okay. We also let the guards, security guards, know in advance. That, so the only the bank kind of oh, okay. teller would be not on the in and would actually kind of go through the protocol, but everyone else was aware of what's going on. Uh, we also had, uh, you know, uh, 
kind of lawyer's letter that uh, we're ready to pull if someone says, hey, what's going on? It's like, you know, the police comes, which happened not once. And you have to explain, like, you know, it's actually a pretend back robbery. We're just doing it to test security. We had all the repertoire of things you can imagine happen when you try to do it. But at the same time, it was relatively safe. Okay. But you get you got to get a little bit of an adrenaline rush for that, right? Extremely. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, so... Don't try it at home. Okay, <laughs> is my one sentence. <laughs> All and right. So yeah, I mean, it, it's scary no matter what because you never know. And and yeah. you know, once you say the word, it's a bank robbery. And once you start the process, there's stress in the air, and that's as real as it gets from the perspective of everyone else but you. It's a real bank robbery. They don't know mm -hmm. that it's like a test, and that's the only way you can prepare them. So after you kind of finish the hack and you explain to them, they actually find it useful because now they know how they would act if it were real and what to do. But it's a Pretty intense moment. I bet, yeah. So then you meet this neuroscientist, uh, Dr. Francis Crick. Is that how I say his name? Yes. And right. that's the guy that changed your life because he was saying, well, you're studying hacking, but why not study hacking of the brain? That's the most important thing you could hack. So talk about him. He, you said he's your idol. Yeah, I mean, he was my idol way before I met him in person. I actually hmm. went to meet him because I came as like a fanboy to see him giving a talk. But his story was that he himself was a hacker during World War II, a different type of hacking, different type of machinery, but he was kind of hacking into the German radar system during the war. And when the war ended, he said, what, what do you do with those skills afterwards? Like, what, what does a hacker do when they're unemployed? And he was recruited by James Watson, who was a biologist, who told him, look, there's this molecule that I'm looking at, has those letters A, G, T, C, and they seem like a code. Do you know how to make sense of that? And then taking his skills as a hacker, applying them to biology, he was able to decode the human genome and essentially was the guy who discovered the DNAs. The yeah, double helix of DNA. Yeah. 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 Francis and Crick. So That's Crick amazing. Is the, is the second name out of the... Uh, uh, sorry, Jim, uh, Watson and Crick, said Francis. Right, Francis right. First name. Watson and Crick were the team that uh, decoded the DNA. And, and this was applying hacking skills to biology and working it out. Later, years after, he became a neuroscientist. And when he met me and learned that I'm doing basically in his mind the same thing, hacking into systems, uh, but doing it only for the service of security, he said, forget about security. Take those skills, bring them to the world of now neuroscience. You will find a lot of uses for those that can help the world. And mm -hmm. that was basically the transition from hacking into vaults of banks to hacking into our inner vault that is yeah. our information. Amazing. Yeah. And so before we get into all the amazing research that you're doing, one more thing I wanted to point out, um, if you could talk about just a little bit about the movie and TV work stuff that you do, like your consultant with, uh, you were with Mr. Robot and the Limitless show. And did I hear Ancient Aliens as well? I, I, I was once, this was not consulting, this was once I was interviewed there uh, and, and kind of and somehow became involved with how they think about things because I tried to change the way the show's course goes. Uh, I tried to take the word alien uh, from the show and make it about science. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> this was my involvement. Um, so I guess, so I was, I was a grad student at Caltech in Los Angeles, which is uh, conveniently close to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes you would have Hollywood producers show up at Caltech and pick a scientist and ask him or her to help them with the movie. They would say, you know, we have this TV show house and house uh, pulls some uh, chemicals into a jar. And we have a line that says, put chemical name here, put kind of quantities here. And we don't know what it is. I mean, the scientists to come and kind of say, this would be benzodiazepine 20 CC. Mm. So would you do that? And I signed up to do that first for, I think, one or two TV shows. And I did a good job. And they said, we, you know, you kind of, you're interested in film. You're, you have good ideas. You don't just like putting the, you know, quantities where we need to, but also giving us ideas for how the science could work forward. Would you want to do that as a permanent position and I started doing it for the Academy uh, of Film uh, for now over a decade where every now and then they would send me a script for a movie or a pilot TV or so and they say look we have science there can you make sure it's accurate can you help us figure out how it works and sometimes it's critical for the narrative of the show sometimes they say well we don't know how the show ends we need a scientist to actually figure out mm -hmm. what this drug does kind of figure it out and here's the plot and sit and solve it for us and i do that yeah and so with limitless i think you would finish uh the 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 ending of the first season and they loved it so much they're like actually we're going to put that on season two and we're going to stretch the show out we loved it so that's really cool so do you get a, how come you don't get a writing credit for that if you 
you know, I, I once went to see the, the filming of a show that I put the kind of, I mean, you know, at the end, it's like a few words here and there. It's not like you kind of have mm-hmm. big input. But I asked uh, asked myself the same question because one time I went to the filming of a show that I put a lot of science in. And I kind of saw that the director actually makes the show and none of the things I said were actually in there. Oh. I said, you know, I spent so much time kind of putting all of those kind of details in the show and like really making sure that this drug goes with that drug and that like the numbers work out. How come it's not in the show? I said, oh, we don't need it. And I said, so why do you even uh, kind of make me go through all these hoops <laughs> of really making sure it works? He says, so that we can put in the credit a uh, science advisor uh-huh. and everyone would be able to kind of go to you if there's questions. But I think that what's interesting, and that would be my last sentence on that, if you, because I could go into a one hour monologue just on that. Sure, sure. Is that the world becomes more interested in that, as in there are now people who would pause Mr. Robot on one frame and they would magnify it and they would try to read the text on the screen to make sure that it actually makes sense. And hmm. if you know, if you have like a Game of Thrones character that has a Starbucks mug on the table or a <laughs> That's right. Casio watch, they're going to go up in arms. So I sure. think the directors are starting to move to really caring about that. And even if there's like a moment where the camera pans over a screen they would bring me and they say we want you to look at the screen and make sure that the text on the screen makes sense and if we use some jargon on kind of the background of a conversation you're going to put the jargon that it would make sense to someone who kind of magnifies that and stops that and it goes to extreme levels of you know the what's the uh, stars alignment uh, in the night where the two people kiss because it happened in 1920 and Mm -hmm. you want to make sure that it's like the right constellation makeup. Mm. So they really now started to go into details and it's a lot of fun to think about those things. Yeah, that's really cool. So now let's talk about your your, your research here uh, with education and learning. So you say that, um, you know, b- brains learn differently. And this was an interesting point because I worked in education for 17 years and probably didn't need 17 years to figure this out. But you say school systems are outdated and because they're putting all the brains of, uh, you know, people in one room and just hoping that they learn. But you're saying that it would be better to separate kids by learning styles and, rather than age and geography. That's really interesting. Talk about that. I agree. And I should say it's not just about kids. It's about anyone. Like people who listen to you right now, mm. your audience they have different ways of understanding me. And some people maybe understand it better when you say things compared to when I say things. Some people understand it only when they pause and think about it and continue. So every person has a different learning profile. And we kind of went to the average one that we know how to work with best. And we created a system that works with that. And we throw out a lot of people who don't operate the same way. So so the concrete example with kids, for instance, is that some kids uh, get things really, really fast when you tell them right away, but then they need a lot of time to really practice that themselves to actually cement that. And some kids, the opposite. They don't understand it when you tell them. They actually have to practice and play and make mistakes, and then they get it themselves. Mm-hmm. So just, just those two examples, there are different styles of learning, but you put them in the same class and you broadcast to them the same way, and it will work perfectly for one, but totally horrible for the other one. And it's going to lead to outcomes that are bad, but you don't know how to operate for that. Another suggestion that we had was to actually try to learn each student's profile and then match them with the perfect teacher or perfect teaching mm-hmm. style. Now, that's a, a, a change of a lot of things because right now the school system operates by years. Basically, if you're six, yeah. you're with six-year-olds. If mm-hmm. you're seven, you're with seven-year-olds. No one says, let's take the nine-year-old, six-year-old, and seven-year-old that learn the same way and put them together in class because we think that it's age that matters. And we learned that it's not true, but we didn't change it. Yeah, that's well, hopefully they can figure that out at some point because I think you're right. I think it really needs a rehaul, the whole thing. So that's, that's again, that's a whole nother hour. Um, but let's talk about now free will. You've talked a lot about this. Um, explain this example. This is really interesting to me that there are more dentists named Dennis or Dennis, sorry, named yeah. Dennis. That is what that is so fascinating to me. Why explain why that is. So this is an example for something that neuroscientists would call embodied cognition. It's a name for a field that boils down to the fact that things in the environment leak into our thinking and affect our behavior. Specifically, uh, there are a lot more than you would expect uh, dentists whose first name is Dennis. Now, of course, we can see quickly what's the connection here. Dennis and dentist sound the same, and somehow this leads to more dentists choosing to be dentists. Now, if you ask a dentist, why did you choose to be a dentist? They would not say, well, my name sounded like a dentist. So I chose this profession. <laughs> they would tell you a story about them always caring about medicine and helping people and teeth were interesting for them. They would tell you a story. The reality is that most likely what happened was that a person's name was Dennis. 
and they walked in the world and suddenly they heard someone calling their name. So they looked and said, so you called me? And they said, oh, no, no, you're talking about dentists. Never mind. They just thought that you're calling my name. And they kept moving on. And then another time they heard about themselves and they looked and it turns out to someone talking about dentists. So they just heard about dentistry a lot more than the average because it was salient. It sounded like their name. So they just paid more attention. In the end, when they turn 25 and they choose a profession, the dentistry option is just more salient in their brain because they heard about it much, much more. They think that there are a lot more dentists out there because they just hear about them. We all went and heard the word dentist, but we just ignored it and they paid attention to it. And that's why they actually choose freely to become dentists, but the proportions of the options are different. So they still have a little bit more awareness. And to kind of take it to the bigger picture, we all have this experience in our life where things sound like us and we pay more attention to them, or they are affecting us because it's uh, colder in the room we're at and it affects our mood and we are a little bit meaner because the temperature is affecting our mood and we don't notice that. We don't say, well, I'm a little bit more mean to you because I'm shivering. We would think that we're just mean to you because you're not nice. But actually, it's other things that leak into our perception that change our thinking. I'll give you another example that will be the last one because, again, we can go into an hour talk about just mm -hmm. the knowledge condition. When Hurricane uh, Sandy uh, happened a few years ago, mm. they looked at people who donated money to actually kind of help uh, the re relief afterwards. And it turned out that a lot of people who gave money had a name that sa sounded similar to Sandy. People that sounded like S Sandra and Sam and uh, Sally. So it's just that the Hurricane itself has a name. And all the people whose name sounded like a week and kind of paid more attention to it. It sounded like someone talks to them. And so they cared more and they gave more money and so on, which is kind of strange because we name hurricanes alphabetically kind of arbitrarily. We don't say, well, this hurricane is going to eat Louisiana. Let's see what name is mostly prominent in Louisiana and name the hurricane that name. So most people in Louisiana will hmm. pay attention. We kind of think of policies like they're independent of people's psychology. But it turns out that the name of a hurricane will change a lot as to what people do to give money to help the relief. And we, we could start thinking about it and actually change policies accordingly. That's fascinating. And then now, now do you do experiments like this with people, right? Where they think that they're making the decision, but you're manipulating things in the lab, right? Many times. So th this is the kind of bread and butter of our experiments, trying to make your brain do things behind your back. Now, of course, there's a philosophy here. What is your back versus what's your brain? But the point is that you will give us one answer and we will know that the answer that you give is kind of flawed or incomplete. And we would actually have a better answer that comes from your brain. And we will pit them against each other and understand why is it people come up with answers that are not true to actions that they made without knowing what drives their actions. That's the kind of setup that we use for most of our experiments. Yeah. So, and talk about this with like emotions and pain. Like if someone's going, you're talking about someone going running, you know, for the first mile, their legs hurt. And then they just keep pushing themselves like emotion can heighten, you know, like why sports teams do better at home. But like I had a Navy SEAL on my show and, and he was explaining like, you know, motivations BS. And then our, you know, our brains don't want to do anything. So we have to like kind of override our brains. And, and so how do you do, how do people, cause it's so hard to control emotions, but you're kind of doing research and experiments on how to teach people how to better have control of emotions. So, so there, there are many ways to answer. I'll give you one, and then if you want, we can elaborate. So one of the experiments we do is experiment that just asks this exact question. And that is, uh, what's the connection between our brain and our body when it comes to moments that are difficult? As a, an example that will resonate with your audience easily, I would say that uh, if you went to the gym and worked really, really hard, at the end, you'll be sore. Because your brain knows that this feeling of soreness happened after you went to the gym, it can create a connection between, okay, I exercised a lot, that's why I feel so. You would ignore this pain and you would actually you know, flag it as like a good thing or as a way that things work. Now, if you woke up this, mo this morning with the same pain that you would feel after the gym without going to the gym, for the same pain, you would be alarmed, you go to the doctor and you say something is wrong. Because even though it's the same pain, the fact that you have a reason for that, that you know, okay, it's caused by this action and it's going to go away tomorrow, allows you to essentially frame this pain as a positive thing. So if you just woke up and you felt pain without any reason for it, without having been to the gym an hour before, you would think my body is failing, need to do something about it. This suggests that the way our brain perceives pain changes the entire experience to it being negative, to it being positive. So the pain could be positive if you associate it with 
So the body is working out me being stronger. Take it to the extreme. Many times when we do things, our body says, I don't like it. Let's stop. And your ability to frame the story differently allows you to continue or to stop. So for example, if you run a marathon, surely at some point, whether you're an athlete that exercises for that all your life or not, around mile 20, you would be in pain and your brain's going to tell you, please stop. That's the natural, normal, kind of rational, makes sense uh, answer to your body not doing something that it's used to doing. It's, it's not easy. You, you burn a lot of uh, calories, more than the usual. You, your body is actually exercising and stretching its limits. It will tell you to stop because you say to yourself, I know what causes this pain. I know what my goal is. I know that it's not going to kill me. You can actually tell your body to continue and do things even though it asks you to stop. And this ability is something that you can train for. So we can take athletes or Navy SEALs or any person, CEOs, and train them to not make their stronger body work for them, but make their brain control the body differently. So we can help you, uh, you know, keep working when you are uh, feeling that you want to stop or control your emotions when you feel that they take over. Or in the context of the athletes that we worked with in a study, we actually tried to break their body and try to see when is the moment that their brain tells their body, let's stop. And we try to tell them, look, we're going to now read the brain activity from your brain in those moments when you're about to quit, when you say, I can't do it anymore. And we're just going to tell you that we know that you're there and we'll ask you to spend one more minute in this state. So just train your brain to continue running, lifting weights, uh, I don't know, cycling for one extra minute after the moment that your brain wanted to quit. It doesn't matter if it took you 10 minutes or 20 minutes, like based on your muscles, it will take you different times. Mm -hmm. But when you get to this moment, we're going to train you to stay there for a little longer. And this will train your brain to endure the pain a little longer. And that's a change of game for athletes. Yeah, no, that's exactly what the Navy SEAL guy was saying with the, with the hell weeks. He'd say like, okay, just, you know, let me just go one more minute. And he's always like pushing himself one more. He doesn't say, oh, okay, I'm going to run another 20 miles. He's like, all right, let me just run for one more minute. And then it's just like, you just keep, doing that so that's kind of like a way to trick your brain in a way and i can tell you the opposite which is i was a soldier for many years in the israeli military one of the ways to break us was to basically tell us okay one more minute that's it like just push for one more minute we're gonna get to this uh, know, milestone and that's we're gonna uh, that's when we're gonna stop and just when you get there they say actually three more minutes uh, so the fact that you kind of get your brain used to okay i can summon all my energy and keep it together for 60 more seconds and then someone pulls the rug and says actually it's going to be 180 more seconds is much harder for your brain than if they just told you you're going to run now four more minutes hmm. the fact that you kind of like are sitting in this place where you frame the milestone as the end and you put all your energy and then you ask for more can actually break you so it's Either way, like you can lie to yourself and make your brain do more things, or someone else can lie to you and break you just by kind of changing the end posts repeatedly. Yeah. And so, I mean, there is neuroscience behind this. And then the other thing you talk about is like, if people want to be funnier, if they want to be smarter, more successful is surround themselves with people that are like that. And I've heard a lot of like, you know, psycho uh, life coaches and things say this, but there is some science behind this as well. Right. So I think that there's kind of like a... a you know, a lot of coaches who tell you something like you're the sum of the five people around you, which right. is kind of the, the, the essential similar idea, a little less quantitative. So what we did as neuroscientists, we started to look at the uh, synchrony between the brains of people. So you and I right now, we've been talking for a few minutes. Something about the communication isn't just transferring information from your brain to my brain by you, you using acoustics and it translates over the internet to sounds on my head and then it becomes uh, percept in my mind we actually also align our brains. By uh, the speed at which you talk, my brain immediately tries to align itself and we kind of go into the same speed. I probably made you speak a little faster than your usual and you made me speak a little slower than usual because we start with different paces. Mm. And mine is kind of a little bit hectic because I have different accents. So it immediately forced you to kind of uh, do things differently. Uh, whether you look at me or look away when I talk actually kind of is coded in my brain as what I'm saying in this moment is resonating with him or not. And even without paying attention to it, my brain says, okay, this sentence didn't work out. Say it again mm. differently because the person kind of looked confused. All of those cues that, that happen, they actually are 
subliminal. Like we don't really say, oh, he is confused. Let me say it again a second time with different words. We just learned to incorporate them and work with them, but they lead to our brains over time when we interact, synchronizing. We learn to speak each other's language better. We learn to use the same metaphors. We learn to basically what we call share a reality. Hmm. Now you did it with two people, the two brains synchronized. You had a third person, all three brains synchronized, all combinations, one, two, one, three, two, three. You start doing it with larger populations. Populations become more alike. And if you can't do that, if you can't really become like the population, you usually stand out. You People say that you have less empathy or that you're weird or that you have some kind of elitist behavior. So people who, who are not able to do that are perceived by the community as somehow an outlier for better and for worse. Now, all of this to say that those cues change our brains, not just by us learning things kind of cognitively, you teach me something, I'm learning it, but also over some kind of osmosis of information. And that's when I say that if you want to be funnier, you don't have to just learn to be funny by reading a book of 1000 Jewish jokes and memorize them. That's one way that will take things cognitively. But to be funny involves also timing and knowing how to change your uh, voice and take a pause before you give the punchline. And that's something that you will learn by being next to comedians in this case for a while. You will see them do it and you will learn it, inter in internalize it without knowing that you're learning it. You'll just kind of start doing it because your brain waves synchronize and you'll become a better comedian because you're next to comedians. And it's true for if you're next to people that are on time, you would internalize their thinking of how time works and you'll be more on time without saying, okay, I need to leave home 15 minutes earlier than I used to because I now learned that this is the way. You will just see that they do it. They leave home earlier and you will start doing it with them. And suddenly you're much more on time without knowing what happened. And it's true for many, many traits that are happening to us without us cognitively saying, I'm going to now become that. Hmm. Yeah. And I think you talked about um, how people, it, or it takes eight times of repetition for the brain to be rewired. Like it takes eight times for, if you see a commercial for then it's kind of like hardwired in your brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's... There's a study by a colleague of mine. He, he showed that, you know, it's average. Like some people need N equal one, just one repetition already wires. The younger you are, the fewer uh, kind of repetitions you need, but the average was eight. So eight times you you kind of see a pairing of two associations, A and B together, is when your brain says, you know what, I'm going to actually create a set of neurons that will code this association as one. So every time you see George Clooney, you will think of Nespresso. I think that's the right pairing of like a, a, a spokesperson and right. product. Eight times of you seeing them will actually take the cluster of neurons in your brain that code George Clooney and the cluster of cells that code Nespresso create a third cluster that just fires for the two of them together. And suddenly when you see one of the two, the same cells fire. So your brain created a mapping of two items into one. Okay. And so then, so, and then we're talking about memories. So memories can change over time. And you, and you talk about how that's like, that's why therapy works is, um, uh, you know, you're, you're, we're controlling the narrative. And then when you keep telling the story, it changes every time you tell it, because you're going to remember the most recent time that you told it. So by telling it in therapy, and then kind of reshaping it, that's how therapy works. Is that? You said it perfectly. I couldn't say it better. So, so oh. I, I, I let it, I let it simmer the way you did it. I, I think that the best analogy that I could think of is a telephone game. Only that's happening in our brain with ourselves. Hmm. So, you know, telephone games, you tell someone something and they tell someone else and then someone else and it kind of keeps changing because every time someone uses it, they modify a little bit and by the time it gets to number 10, it might be a different story. This is what's happening in our brain all the time. We have a memory. Whenever we talk about this memory or we use it, we open it and we use it, tell a story to our therapist, but also we expose it to information leakage from the therapist, from our mindset at that moment. And then we overwrite the original. And then tomorrow, if someone asks us about the same memory, we won't load the original. We're going to load the overwritten version that was modified the day after. And then we're going to, again, allow it to be modified and maybe changed and overwrite it again and again. So the more we use the memory, the more it's changed. And that's a feature of our brain, not a bug. that allows us to actually take bad memories and instead of just relieving them again and again and just going through the same trauma without getting out of it, to actually expose the trauma to some information from the outside world that allows us to change it. So after eight, 10, 20 repetitions, 10 sessions with a the therapist, you can still remember that you were in the uh, tank that exploded or that your girlfriend dumped you. But instead of just relieving the moment again and again and not being able to get out of it, you can look at the memory from far away and say, okay, yes, the tank exploded and my friends were hurt, but here's some way for me to be able to move on with my life without just constantly smelling the smell of the burning 
or, or, or re-seeing the, the images or when I think about the ex-girlfriend to not just keep saying, why did she leave me? I can't move on. I'm stuck there. But actually say, okay, there, there are ways for me to move on. That's a feature of our brain that allows us to work out and move away from things without totally relieving them all the time. But couldn't it be work uh, in the same way negatively? Like if you have a breakup with somebody and then you're telling people that, you know, you're the victim in this, it was all her fault. And maybe you're shaping it in a, in a, in an untruthful way and making it worse on yourself and making her, you know, making it seem more, you know, traumatic than it really was rather than trying to. Yeah. So it can work. So I think, I think that opening a memory, I, I painted it in a good way. Uh, because I think the role of therapists is to be the positive nudgers. So, mm. so you go to your therapist, you tell them the story of the exploding tank. If they're good therapists, they would know that right now your memory is malleable and available for notifications, and they will introduce ways to look at it differently that would allow you to see it better and overwrite it with a better version. A bad therapist or bad friends or, or kind of bad experiences would lead you to maybe amplify it and see it in, in worse light. And I think that, of course, we rely on our human brain's desire to get better. So the assumption is that every time you open it, you try to help yourself get better. And this changes the internal view. Or if you cannot, you go get help from friends, therapists, any service that could help you. And their job, if they're good, is to do that, to say, hey, let's not just keep telling you it's actually your fault that she left you mm -hmm. and, and you're responsible for that and, and you deserve it and like make it worse, but actually tell you, okay, there is a light in the tunnel and get better. You're right. We, we, the valence of things looking better is only because I assume that people are making an effort, but if you're not making an effort to get it better, you can easily spiral into worse thoughts. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Um, now let's talk about also about memory. So uh, obviously you do work with the brains. Now, I've been told that uh, memories are not actually stored in the brain. They, they're stored in the body. Um, like for people with organ transplants, you know, like uh, my dad wrote a book about this stuff. And, uh, you know, there was a lady that was a, she was a, a lesbian and then she got a heart transplant and then she became straight. So do you, are you familiar cool. with this topic or like, what do you think of this? You took me away from my, uh, out of my comfort zone. So, so, you know, <laughs> we, we know definitely where in the brain our memory is stored. When, when you store memories in the brain. Now, we, I yeah. think that what you're saying, which is kind of new uh, thing, is that there are uh, things that are stored outside of the brain in the form of genetic material. So we know that there are kind of stories of like uh, epi, uh, epi uh, kind of uh, basic epigenetics when a parent inherits, inherits to their offspring some traits in the genetic material. So, so things that turn into genetic material that are actually in the kind of periphery of the cells move from the parents to the kids. And, and, and that's kind of like getting a little bit of interest right now from scientists mm -hmm. uh, because you know the, the classical uh, genetics said that you don't move traits to your offsprings outside of ones that are coded in your DNA. So if you got a tattoo, your kid won't be born with a tattoo because tattoos are not part of your genetics. They're not sure. part of your DNA. This is the assumption. Now we know that there are some things in the form of, for instance, learning and memories that actually aren't part of your DNA, but they do transfer from parents to kids, but it's still very, very mechanical. It's like, it, it's not, it's not spiritual. It's not that like you, you really kind of, uh, you know, some soul transfers from one to another. Uh, there's are things that we can actually quantify and find tangible. And, and the research there is relatively new. It's less than 10 years. Uh, and, and it's kind of very, uh, I, I would say, not sexy when it comes to what actually gets transferred from like the parents, to the kids. It's not that we find that, you know, you really kind of uh, change things that you learned in your life. Like you, you learn history and your son is born knowing history. It's not at the level of like really knowledge. It's more like um, the example that is often uh, used is one where uh, a baby monkey that's born on day one, it's never seen a snake in its life. So it doesn't know that it needs to be afraid of snakes Yet, if you show the, snake, the, the monkey a picture of a snake, its pupil dilate, its heart starts racing. So it definitely exhibits signs of fear. And the assumption is that the parents learned to be afraid of snakes because they actually saw a snake attacking another monkey and it became like a thing. And they coded this information in some way in their material that they actually deliver to the offspring, such that the offspring is born without knowing what it, a snake is or why it's afraid being afraid of that. And this translates to actually over time, 
uh, a neural pathway. So we kind of, you know, set the setup for the baby to already have a pathway to that. And it's kind of shown that, you know, humans generally are more afraid of darkness than of light or of loud sounds than of quiet time as babies. Like you've never heard loud sound, but you already bought presumably over genetics, we passed from one to another the fact that darkness is riskier than light for humans. And that's why you're born with a setting that is a little bit more probabilistically likely to be afraid of darkness as a baby, even though you've never really experienced that, you know, bad things happen when it's dark compared to the good things because our light in our senses are not as heightened. Right. But I think that I'm putting the rug a little bit. We don't know that, you know, that you can actually change entirely a personality with like small modifications of that nature how did you was it i thought i can't remember if you did this experiment or you were talking about this experiment with the rats and learning the maze and how they transfer how do you transfer the knowledge of that maze to the next rat what, explain that right so this is a study by a colleague of mine that works with rats i i, I do only human uh, work <laughs> okay uh, and, and 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 with rats you can do a lot more things than you can do with humans for two reasons first we know a lot about their brains like they're smaller brains and we mapped pretty much everything mm. genetically and at the level of neuron and also uh, they're kind of similar to one another you can genetically engineer a rat with a specific condition that works mm. well and you can also open their brain and do things you cannot do with humans uh, clinically so the classical study that I think you talk about is one where you take rat one, you put the rat in a maze, and the rat learns to navigate the maze and find the cheese at the end, and mm -hmm. she does it maybe 10 times, and at some point she gets to a level where she just knows the maze. And we can actually find in her brain the exact mapping of the maze. There are cells in the brain called place cells, and you can see that the rat gets to a T section, and a cell lights up and tells her to go right, and she gets another one, and the cell lights up and tells her to go left. So you can actually see the mapping of the maze in the rat's brain such that the rat can navigate the maze perfectly in like one go. She just goes to the rat and she's like running to the, to the cheese perfectly. Now you find this mapping in the brain. You take a new rat. It's never been to the maze. It's a rat. It has the same cells that code places and locations and movement, but it's never actually used them in this particular maze. So it doesn't know the maze. And you start zapping the new rat's brain in the order and sequence of the maps sales. So you basically trigger this new rat to think about making a right turn, making a left turn, right, right again, left, left, straight, left, and so on. So you kind of zap the brain and the rat essentially gets the feeling that she should go right, she should go left, straight, and so on without even knowing why. And then you drop it in the maze and she just reactivates the map that is in her brain, and she basically acts as if she knows how to get from the beginning to the end in one go without having ever been there. So effectively, what he did is you took a memory from one rat, and you put it in the other rat's brain, and it now knows something. And after it actually does it once, it cements the memory in its brain. So now it just knows that this image which has in her mind actually maps to the real world. And from then on, she can just navigate the maze perfectly. So you move the memory from one entity to another. There's no theoretical reasoning why this wouldn't work with humans mm. or any other animal. We just have not tried it yet. Okay. But so one thing that you have done now, let's talk about your work with dreams. So I think originally you said recording dreams was impossible. And, um, uh, but then I think they, the, the press kind of twisted with your words and you said that they said that you said it was possible, uh, but then some scientists in Japan figured it out and cause he didn't know it was impossible. And now you're working with him and then explain your work on dreams. It's fascinating stuff. So, so this, of course, is one of my favorite topics right now. It's kind of what I spend all my time these days. So I will have to really work out to stop myself from spending the next <laughs> half an hour just talking about that. But I'll say the following. Dreams are fascinating to humans since the dawn of time. You can find mm -hmm. uh, pictures of dreams on hieroglyphs in caves 5,000 years ago. And if you go to any historical records, like the Bible, uh, mythology, it's all about dreams affecting our lives. And if you don't want to go far into history, you can go to today. And if you wake up one morning and tell your ex, your girlfriend that you dreamt about your ex-girlfriend, you will see that they would respond to dreams as if they're real. Like they would say, how could you dream about your ex-girlfriend? Uh, what, don't you love me? And you say, it wasn't my choice. It's a dream. It just happened to me. But somehow you would be blamed in the real world for your dreams. All this to say is that we in the real world think that dreams are meaningful. And we attribute a lot of function to them, like as if they, they mean something that, that drives our awake behavior. And it's so much so that a lot of psychology relies on dreams as a key aspect of who we are. And you know, Freud and Carl Jung and, and others in the last hundred years 
have made an entire kind of discipline out of asking people to wake up in the morning and tell the therapist what their dreams are about and having the therapist and the person together try to come up with a reasoning behind that. But here's the flaw that kind of pulls the rug out of everything that Freud did and in a way kind of changes the entire narrative. The stories that people tell when they wake up are flawed. They're not really the dream's story. They're the story that you tell when you wake up and try to Hmm. pick residues of the dream and make meaning out of them. Because you can't not remember really. the whole thing. Is that what it is, right? You can't remember. And yeah. you use the language of your awake self. I'll give you a concrete example that will make mm-hmm. it easy. In the 1910s, when people were asked about their dreams, most people described their dreams in black and white. Why? Because movies were in black and white back then. And people thought a dream is kind of like a movie that's happening in my head. Mm-hmm. How do movies look? Well, they look in black and white. So that's how it made my dreams were. In 1950, when movies started having colors, everyone immediately shifted to describe their dreams in color. No one told them now you should, but it's like, again, they thought, okay, dreams are like movies, movies are in color. So I guess my dreams are in color, which means that we don't know if the dreams in your head are in color in black and white. What we know is that you use the language of your awake self, which is language of color or black and white, and you describe your dreams. And there are many examples like this one that show that people's reporting of their dreams is not flawed in that they lie. It's just not really accessing the dream itself it's accessing the awake person's interpretation of a dream already and it's useful i think freud was right that it's meaningful to see why do you even come up with this story rather than that story why do you choose black and white rather than than color to tell your story but it's also confusing because it's incomplete fast forward to the last 10 years neuroscientists like myself were able to actually look at the dreams while you're sleeping so we don't have to ask you any question we don't need you to tell me a story we can look at your brain while you're sleeping and extract the dream from your brain directly. And then we can ask you questions when you wake up and see why is it that you forget some parts or what is it that you forget or how do you tell a story compared to how your brain tells a story. We can start still asking you questions, but we also have access to the source. That's a big change. And this is only step one, which is to read the dreams. We're doing a good job in getting there. We're still not as good as you can imagine. We don't really kind of have a DVD with beautiful... <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so it's visual. not... So what is it? You're, it's Because it's not a video of the person's dream. Is it? Is it text or is it... I mean, what have you mapped out? So what we basically do is before you go to sleep, we look at your brain and this is now my work. So mm-hmm. we, we work with patients who undergo brain surgery and they have electrodes inside their brain right. while they're operated on for clinical purposes. Mm-hmm. So we have access to a human being with open brain and electrodes inside. That's just the setup that we work. So now that we have electrodes in your brain, we would come to you and you say, Chuck, I'm going to now show you a thousand pictures, one after the other, a picture of an NFL player, a picture of, I'm just looking at the pictures behind you, oh, sure. uh, of a, a record, a picture of a kind of the Abbey Road, a, a Emmy Records crossword, crossword, whatever kind of a, I could think would be in your mind. And I'll just show you those one after the other while I record your brain activity. And at some point, I'll show you the Beatles record. And suddenly I would see one cell lighting up. Mm. I said, aha, uh-huh. we found in Chuck's brain the cell that codes the concept of the Beatles. When you think of the Beatles, this wow. cell is the memory of the Beatles. Okay. And then we find another cell that codes the, uh, you know, I don't know, the image of Nirvana. I'm just going to now go with a... a so it's different for Python. each person. It's it's an different individual for mapping for each person. It wouldn't be it the might same be for you. In this, even even you across multiple days, you might shift them and move them around. But at that moment, wow. we know exactly that today. This is the Mike Tyson cell in Chuck's brain, and okay. it's for the next couple of hours, not going to move. Yeah. So once we map the few of those, we have to go to sleep, and we might give you a task that will increase the chance of you dreaming of Mike Tyson, but it doesn't really matter. You go to sleep, and if during the night when you sleep and you're in the specific moment, which is this moment where we think dreams are most likely to happen. It's called the REM uh, sleep. If at that moment, the see that the Mike Tyson cell lights up, we would know that you in your mind right now are thinking Mike Tyson. Now, we wouldn't know if you're thinking Mike Tyson wearing uh, you know, white pants or is he fully dressed or does he have a tattoo on his head? We don't know what you see, but we know that the concept of Mike Tyson is activated in your mind. Hmm. And if immediately after you would think of your mom, we will know the think of your mom. So we can build a narrative that's building... And a story, not with visuals, but with kind of uh, entities or, or percepts, we call them concepts, one after the other, like this, 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 this. And this sometimes is enough to have a clue as to what was the story. Like if you told me that you went with your mom to Paris a few years ago, and I see that in your dream, you have yourself, you have your mom, you have the Eiffel Tower, and you have a baguette kind of lighting up in this sequence. I could suggest that maybe it's you dreaming now about your 
journey with your mom to Paris. I wouldn't know if it's true, but if you wake up and you tell me in my dreams, I was actually with my mom in London seeing the Big Ben, I would say, that's interesting. I think that he was in Paris. He uses a European example with a landmark that's like the, the parallel of the Eiffel Tower. So why is it changing? And I will just ask you questions and I use that. But now we have at least a clue as to what we think about in your brain. And so it's, it's far from being perfect, but it's a big step compared to nothing. Yeah. So, but we were 10 years ago. Yeah. So, what it, because you, when people, like you said, they're having brain surgery, so they already have their brains are open. You can put these electrodes in. And I thought you said something about you can control or stimulate the brain while they're dreaming, and people can actually take control of their dreams and be in charge. How does that work? Okay. So, so we finished box one, which is reading dreams. Yeah. Which reading is what them. I mentioned right now. Yeah. Now we can move to box two, which is now taking my hacking skills to the uh, hacking skills the of, of, yeah. of neuroscience and say, okay, it's not enough to just read whatever is in the vault. Let's see if we can actually change something in the vault. And what we're doing right now is we're trying to, to both use cues from the outside world to actually navigate your dream. So it could be as simple as spraying a smell into your nose in the right moment in mm -hmm. your dream. So it will change the course of the dream and take you suddenly to thinking about the NFL rather than about Mike Tyson just by activating a different memory. That's that's the easy one using sound or, or smell or cues that are easy. Is that like how you did the, the smoker thing where people who were addicted to smoking, you, you spray a, a sulfur smell and then they wake up and they're like, oh, I don't actually want to smoke anymore because they've exactly. associated the nicotine with the rotten egg smell. A study by a colleague of mine, Anat Arzi, where she basically did exactly that. She, she was the one who pioneered this method where you take a person, you wait for them to get to the right moment where you're brain is eavesdropping or, or listening to the outside world and then you activate a percept in this case smoking by smelling by spraying the smell of nicotine and then immediately after you pair it with the smell of rotten eggs this particular example h2s that was the specific a uh, compound that makes the brain cells smoking bad and if you do it enough times in the right moment then the brain creates this conditioning so that when you wake up you don't really have the desire to smoke anymore because somehow in your brain the smoking is now associated with a bad thing for why it actually decays and comes back. So that's one example that's using olfaction, like smells to, to change behavior. The more extreme version, I think, which you just said, is what we're doing right now mostly, is we actually use an invasive thing. So you're sleeping and we have a big magnetic coil. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulator that we can put next to your forehead and turn it on. And it creates electric current that essentially activates brain cells in a specific frequency. And we learned that if you activate it in a a gamma frequency which turns on the cells in the front of your brain it essentially wakes up your executive function which means that you're in your dream right now and we wake up your consciousness but we don't wake you up so you are still asleep you're still dreaming it's just that you're aware now of the fact that you're dreaming which brings you into a state we call mm. lucid dream which yeah. is you're kind of sitting there and you say wait wait it's not real the fact that I'm in a Buckingham Palace right now isn't real, but it is Buckingham Palace for the sake of this movie, and I'm the main character. So I want to have the Queen of England come and have tea with me. And because it's your movie, you're the director, once you say it, boom, the Queen of England enters the room and she sits next to you and you're having tea. And if you want James Bond to join you, you can bring James Bond, or if you want to, uh, you know, uh, bring... Uh, your grandmother who died 10 years ago and have a chat with her after she's no longer with us, you can do that. And it would be as real as it gets because it's your brain creating the imagery. It will not feel to you like you're puppeteering her. Like it will be her words coming at you, even though it will be your brain putting the words in her mouth. But from your perspective, you will have a chat with grandma, which you cannot do otherwise. And so even though it's a short experience because then you wake up and it's over, it's the ultimate virtual reality because you can actually bring anyone and for the time being, it feels as real as it gets. And that is the power of lucid dreaming that we're now activating. It before was something that only very few people can actually experience if they were lucky enough to have this naturally happen to them. Yeah. But now using this invasive method, we can give pretty much everyone this experience every night whenever they have a dream. So possibly someday in the future, I can walk into a, a lucid dreaming store and I could say, I want to be uh, Russell Wilson and win the Super Bowl. And you can program my brain. And, and so like I'm dreaming, lucid dreaming, and I'm winning the Super Bowl. It's, I, I would say it wouldn't be a store. It would be in your home. So most likely oh, people would just buy even a better. product that will, you before you go to sleep, you will kind of say, tonight I want to uh, either have a, I don't know, a Super Bowl dream. And I want to be on this team. And I want the team to win and so on. And the machine will 
know that you're in the right spot and just kind of bring you into this state and you can now get, you know, get a dream. Or it could be an entire you know, operation where you can ask a, to have a dream by Steven Spielberg and they would direct your dream for you. Like you just go to sleep and you say, I want a surprise science fiction experience that some famous director give me and I'll wake up in a colony on Mars and we'll do things. I, I want to say, because uh, it's, it's, this will be kind of the, a good way to frame what I just said, that we're speaking enthusiastically about all the positives of that. But I want to make it clear to anyone who listens to you right now or watches this video, that it could easily be a double-edged sword, which is it could be that instead of uh, you having Spielberg direct your dream, it will be someone from Google uh, directing your dream. And in the dream, uh, they will make you buy more Captain <laughs> Crunch in the morning after. So, so, so it, it could easily become a marketing tool for invasive kind of no guards uh, implant of ideas that you would have no way to stop. Yeah, because, well, you talk about these um, people putting chips in their brain. I, I love your analogy, by the way. You're saying, well, you know, if you put this chip in your brain and it can help you make make you smarter and make you, you know, manipulate the stock market better, more people will do that. It's just like uh, having breast implants. That's like you want the advantage. So people because like when you think about a chip in your brain, I mean, it's kind of scary because if somebody hacks that ra rather than just I mean, it could be more nefarious than just Google trying to sell you something. It could be somebody trying to get you to kill somebody or something. So it, talk about these chips in, in the brain. Is this something that's going to happen in my lifetime? It's already existing. So there's already in the US about 40,000 people that have a neural implant in their brain. Now, these people have it because they have a clinical reason. So if you have Parkinson's or if you need a deep brain stimulation or epilepsy, you can go to a doctor mm -hmm. and the doctor will put a neural implant in your brain in the area that is damaged. And this device will help you navigate reality. So if you have epilepsy, for example, and usually there's one part of the brain that starts speaking and provoking activity without any kind of prompt, and this leads to a seizure, you can have a device right now that figures out that there's a signal that is not supposed to be there, and it counters that by kind of putting a counter signal and it stops it and contains it. That's helpful when it comes to epilepsy, but it also means that there's a device inside people's brain that does something. Now, this device needs uh, to get upgrades every couple of months. So it mm. has this kind of code that constantly asks a server nearby, is there a firmware upgrade? And if yes, download it. I can easily, as a hacker, come and pretend to be the server. You will ask me the question once a week, hey, do you have a firmware update? And I would say, yes, there is. Here it is. And I'm now going to download into your chip a firmware update that says, don't just stop seizures, but also once every day, make the person uh, wake up while they're uh, asleep. And I just dis disrupted your uh, cycle uh, forever, which will lead to you, you know, feeling depressed and having a hard time. So this is just an easy way to totally screw someone's life in a very simple update. Of course, I can go farther and farther. I can disrupt your memories. I can uh, you know, wake you up into lucid dreamings whenever I want or uh, navigate your emotions negatively whenever I want. Or when we get better in detecting where in your brain is the desire to do something bad, we can actually, Manchurian candidate style, make you do something bad. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of the, the, the uh, world we live in right now with 4,000 people having it in your brain. When companies offer better devices and more positive things, not just helping you clinically, but actually making you have access to Wikipedia in your mind and you just have the entire world's knowledge in your head, everyone would want that. Not remembering that the same firmware upgrade that we spoke about in the epilepsy chip could be used to give you false Wikipedia data and suddenly you just have fake news in your mind. That's scary stuff. So how do they regulate that? That's like, an, I guess that becomes an ethical dilemma then. I think that's maybe the most important sentence that I would say to your audience. Right now, no one talks about it and thinks about it because it's more like a scientist's exercise and we build it and some companies are interested in that. The only way someone's going to do something about it is if your audience says, you know what, I want it regulated or I don't like this or I want to ask this question of my congresswoman and have them take an opinion on that right now. It's basically your podcast and 10 other podcasts to talk about that because it's not here right now. So it's kind of in the future. And in the future, who knows? But it's going to be fast because we proved that it's possible right now. Mm -hmm. So from 0 to 0 0.1 is a big leap. From 0 0.1 to 1 is fast. In that mm -hmm. sense, it's important that people, not just you and I, think about it and ask questions about it and define uh, how it will look. 
because that's a citizen's role, not a scientist's role. Yeah, I mean, so it is scary, but so some of the things that it, it the positives, obviously, like you said, it, it, so is it actually curing Parkinson's and, and it, can it uh, work with other things? I think you said that it could uh, possibly cure deafness and blindness and maybe Alzheimer's. So different kind of solutions, but but along the same kind of category. So it, so there's a question of like what cure means. It's like a philosophical question. Like you can live your entire life not having a tremor anymore because the chip will always contain the tremor and will make you so you still have parkinson's as in mm -hmm. if i turn a chip off you will start having oh, okay. tremor. right yeah but forever i will contain it so it doesn't look like on the outside like you have it it's kind of like a can you treat know, it you may you may have cancer every day in your body that your body takes care of and stops do you have cancer no because we didn't let it metastasize so you you in theory have cancer all the time it just you don't really have the disease because your body regulates that in that sense, those people that have the chip, they have Parkinson's because it's still there, but they manage to live life entirely without experiencing the Parkinson. And I think you alluded to other chips, which is something that a lot of scientists are building that target different things. So Parkinson's is in the brain, but uh, blindness is in the eye typically. So if you have a retinal problem that makes your eye not do its job, and it can't take photons from the world and turn them into the language of the brain, but your brain is intact, we can now build a retinal implant, which is a device that we put where your eyes are. It does the same thing. It takes photons from the world and it translates them to the language of the brain, which is chemical signaling. And it sends it right to the uh, visual cortex where the brain expects the eyes to send signals to. And then the brain does its job. And from your perspective, you see. You don't even know that the seeing came from a device that processed information differently because when it gets to your brain, it feels the same way. So this is something that's now under clinical trials, retinal implants, taking people who lost their sight and mm. getting the sight back. We already have cochlear implants, very popular with a lot of patients who right. lost their hearing because their ears don't work. We put a device next to their ears, the biological ears, that does the same thing. It takes compressions of molecules in the air and change those into electric signal that goes into the nerve that essentially drives signals into the auditory cortex. And after a few months of having that, people learn to hear again, not even realizing that the hearing didn't come from their ear. It came from the implant, but it did the same thing. It took walls, signal, and turned it into brain signal. And so, and this could be used to uh, help treat mental illness and addiction and all those things too? Very much everything that we know how to isolate in the brain, we can build a device that deals with that. The challenges are that sometimes the, the problems are not easy to pinpoint. Like depression could be a lot of things not working. So it's not as kind of easy as, uh, okay, mm. we know where the ears mm. are and we can do something about it. So we still have to learn. And some of the things are not even brain problems. They're the genetics problems. So we have to kind of mm. figure out. So, so not everything is as, as, as easy as like a, not the right word, but like not everything is isolated as in we can figure out what the problem is and fix that. And some things are also very deep inside the brain. So mm. if you have a problem mm. in some structures that are deep inside, it's harder for us to get there. So the ears are pointing out and the auditory cortex is at the surface of your brain. So we can easily get into it. Oh. If your problems were in the, say, I don't know, amygdala, you actually have to open the brain and start digging inside and going all the way to the center of your brain where the amygdala sits. So it becomes also a neurosurgical challenge. So okay. we're dealing with the identifying the problem is getting there and actually regulation, do we want to do it? Okay. And then one thing I think, I don't think I've ever heard you talk about, but I'm curious, how much a role does hormones? What is that? Because hormones is a big part of emotions and all this stuff. I mean, does that, how does that uh, work with the work research that you're doing? Or, or do you trigger parts of the brain that would, because testosterone is like a drug. So if there, I mean, if you're triggering parts of the brain, the, would that affect the hormones or can you manipulate that at all? So I, I would say the, the example that the analogy that would help, I think everyone understand is that if you think of the brain like a car, the hormones are the gas. Mm. So like, yes, so you, you have the entire car and all the wires are in the right place, but if you don't have gas, it won't work. Mm. And when you have the gas, it also needs to go into the right place. You can take a car and just like pour a bucket of like the <laughs> gas everywhere and mm -hmm. only a few drops will go into the oil tank or into the gas tank and it didn't do anything. So it's not just like, flood the brain with the, I don't know, dopamine and things will work out. The dopamine needs to go to the right areas of the brain to actually not just cause damage, but actually do the right thing. So if you think of the brain, we think of it as like a brain, but actually the brain has different structures and in structures, it has different types of neurons and each neuron uses different molecules, serotonin, dopamine, 
and acetylcholine and all of those to work it out. So all of those need to work together and, and imbalance in any of those. If you, if you have too much myelin on one neuron, you have Alzheimer. If you have too little dopamine, you might have Parkinson's. If you have too much, you might be addicted, to, uh, uh, hmm. more likely to be addicted. So it's a, it's a tight balance between the car chassis, <laughs> the outside layer, uh, everything uh, you know being correctly wired and also having the gas and the oil and the water in the right tank so they in the right balance so they will work all of those together make you think right okay wow fascinating stuff what about um i, I told my dad because he wrote a book about a lot of this uh the ultimate reality stuff and he was really curious what your thoughts were on out-of-body experiences like occur when when people are asleep and or near-death experiences or when they use drugs or there's other ways to induce this kind of stuff what do you what is the neuroscience behind this and it will be a little boring but i'll give it to you okay it's, <laughs> no it's fascinating so, so because it's not there's there's very little mysticism there which i think when people talk about out body experiences they kind of imagine okay i die and my body is floating like a cartoon character with like a little angel <laughs> wings above me that's not what we see in the science but we see a lot of things that suggest that the brain looks for narratives that solve problems in that way for example there's a famous study uh, even though it's famous i forget the name of the author it's sole author uh, i think shahar arzi is his name but i might change that if i'm wrong and i'm giving credit to someone that's not the right guy and he took people patients in the same setup that we have which is patients undergoing brain surgery electrodes in their brain for clinical purposes but he zapped their brain and it happens to be that the electrodes were sitting in the right location to create this out-of-body experience mm. and when he zapped the brain the person reported thinking that they see themselves as if their eyes were like feet behind and they said i see an, i see myself from outside and i'm not in my body and i see my body and I, when i raise my hand i see their hand from the back like they kind of they kind of had this experience now it was all manufactured it was not true of course they were in their body but hmm. somehow their brain was able to create an entire image of themselves out of the body seeing themselves there was an experiment that was done recently uh, by i think it was a, a google team where they uh, took people and had them wear VR goggles. And what you see in the VR goggles is what comes as a feed from a camera. And the camera was actually sitting to your right. So basically you saw yourself. So you raised your hand. And what you saw is a guy raising his hand with a little delay. And even though everyone knew it was them, like they kind of did this and they saw the guy doing this, somehow the fact that you saw yourself from the outside and you had a different perspective, like you saw yourself from your profile, made people react to the person in the movie differently. So if someone came in the feather and tickled you, people did not laugh because from their perspective, they felt the tickling in their body, but they saw it in their eyes as if it came from someone else. And their brain wasn't able to do what's called the binding of the tactile experience with the visual experience. And they felt as if another guy is being tickled and it's not them, even though they felt it was hmm. them. All it is to say is the brain to actually feel in the moment, it needs to combine the senses with a lot of other actions, with the feelings, with the, with, with the experiences internally. And it's very easy to fool the brain and break those and make people think that they're out of their body or that they're not themselves and so on. There's a disorder that's known that happens uh, often uh, to people under stress where they for a moment have this thing. Uh, Oliver Sacks wrote it in his book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, but a person who basically sat on a bed and kept falling out of the bed in the hospital. And when the doctors came, he reported that there's an object in his bed that he wants to get out of his bed and he finds himself on the floor and the object was his leg. He somehow lost the ability to think that his leg is his and he tried to throw the leg and his body followed. Huh. But it, it, it's, a, it's a disorder that could happen to people in certain situations where you lose the connection to your body. All of that is to say that, uh, that us thinking of ourselves as one is an option. It's the most reliable one. It's the one that we're mostly having, but it could easily be dissociated. And it happens when we're sick and it happens when we're uh, taking all kinds of hallucinogenic drugs where we actually feel out of body. The, the, the not mystical part is that it's not like that we're actually out of the body and, and it's, like, it's, it's actually a mechanical thing we can explain, but from the perspective of the person, it's the same. You feel for a second that you're not in your body or that your body is just an option. It's a container and your mind is elsewhere. And it has a lot of uh, kind of cognitive outcomes. You actually think differently when you're not thinking that you're confined to your body, when you're high or when we stimulate your brain. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And then I think we talked a little bit about this, but um, like you have this, uh, what is it called? The brain interface, brain machine interface. Like you think of something and then the machine does it for, I think you kind of, was this kind of like the monkey experiment where the monkey had an artificial arm that was connected to electrodes 
And then they took the artificial arm away and then he, he unlearned how to use his real arm. Right. So this particular one was done by a colleague of mine, Andy Schwartz at the University of Pittsburgh. We're doing it with humans, the same idea, but the idea is, is prevalent. Right now, there are a lot of companies who are trying to make it into a product and all the big tech companies are after that and they hire my students to work on that because the world wants that. And the idea is that when you grab a cup of, cup of coffee with your hand, it was your brain who sent the order to the arm to raise and to the fingers to lock on the coffee. And all of that is starting in your brain. And in theory, if I had access to your brain, I could read the entire instruction and know exactly that you're now telling your arm to move forward and you're now telling your fingers to wrap around the coffee. And if I can read it perfectly, I can actually activate a robotic arm instead of your arm to do the same thing. And if it's a really, really uh, challenging task, like lifting a piano, instead of having you do this, I can bring a crane. And you would think, I want to lift the piano and move it from here to here, but a crane would move instead and grab the piano and move it. And this will take us into a world where you can control everything in your mind. You could control, of course, little devices that will, you know, move coffee for you or move pianos, but you can also fly an airplane like a drone from far away just with your mind or uh, drive your car by thoughts. You would just think I need to go left and the car would go left. So there's no need for you to kind of say, I need to go left. I want to go left. Let's turn the, this wheel and turn it left and so on. All you need to know is I want to be there. And the car will just take this thought and move in the right direction. And you can even go to a world where you say, I want to email Chuck right now. And I want to tell him this thing instead of you having to kind of actively having to press compose and put a subject and typing all, like a lot of actions into happen for me to just do what I already know I want to do. I want to say, tell you, Chuck, I love you. Why not just immediately have the email being sent? Because I already thought the thought, like now it's just like acting on it, which is a waste of energy. So every time you can think something, the brain machine interface will just turn it into action and make it happen. We know how to do it. We know how to read the brain activity and find instructions. We just need to find instructions now for everything, for the letter I, L-O-V-E-Y-O-U. So we can, instead of you typing kind of one by one keyboard, key press by key press, we can just take the thought, I love you, and make it into an action. And at the same time, it can be used to operate everything in the world. What uh, your kind of question alluded to was that we don't know what it does to our brain in terms of atrophy. Like if we never have mm. to think the thought I, L-O-U, L-O-V-E, hmm. Y-O-U, Maybe we we'll lose something. And in the example that uh, Andy Schwartz had at Pittsburgh, after the monkey didn't use his arm to grab a marshmallow in this example for a while, the brain said, I guess we don't longer control this arm with the same brain cells we used to before. So let's now dedicate those brain cells to control the robotic arm and we'll find new cells to control my own arm. And suddenly your brain actually changes and you either get a third arm because your brain just kind of picks new cells and says, from now on, those cells are going to control the biological arm and those cells will control the robotic arm or it might do the opposite it might say we now no longer control the arm because we don't need it and suddenly you will try to move the arm and there just won't be a cell that controls it oh wow fascinating stuff it's like it's a lot of the stuff you're talking about it's like a science fiction movie i mean are they making movies about this kind of stuff i, mean, I guess I guess probably they already have but we started with me, me uh, helping hollywood uh yeah there's a lot of uh a lot of filmmakers that call me with ideas of how to take our work and make it into science fiction i bet in the next couple of years you'll see some of them yeah so wait explain clear this up for me with the inception movie they reached out to you did you say yes or no at that point though this was not the movie this was a tv series so oh so the series a, okay yeah there was a tv series uh, called limitless that came out limitless yeah uh, after the movie and it's nice to be done because the movie is a complete story the tv series starts where the movie ends same characters are there. It's just like continuing it right. in a TV series. Okay. And what the uh, TV series, the movie, and the book that came even before the movie all don't do is they don't explain how the drugs actually work. So there's kind of a drug mm. that makes you smarter and, and, and yeah. better, but they gloss over how it works. But the TV series guys said, we want to actually end by explaining it. And you're going to be the one finding out how. And so here are all the constraints. Here's what happened in the movie. Here's what happened in the book. Here's what already happened in the TV series. So we have all those things that it can and cannot do. With that in mind, solve it for us. Come up mm -hmm. with an answer. And this is what I did. And uh, that's exciting. There. Great stuff. Well, um, I always end each episode with a charity or nonprofit. Can people donate to your research or do you have another uh, charity that you want to promote here at the end? Okay, so for, of course, scientists always need a, a lot of support. And if anyone wants, I'm the easiest guy to find you know, if you just look my name, there are mm -hmm. tons of videos and I have a website and yeah. so on. 
and and I will be concrete even. I think that the this the specific projects that I think are mostly uh, useful right now for the world are the ones that we kind of glossed over that that I said was the most important thing, which is ways to actually stop us from doing it uh, in a commercial way. So I think mm. the scientists in my lab are figuring out ways to do things, and then it's being taken by commercial entities that want to make it into products, and those products could have very good uses, like helping people have better dreams, but also could be used to make you buy more products without your girls. I think that because a lot of companies are, are working on the applications, I think there should be some research done on the other aspects. How can we protect ourselves? How can we make sure that no one gets in our brain? And this, there's little research. So if anyone cares about that, that's where I would put all the uh, ask. Okay. Like, help us like kind of work, sponsor the subjects of, or actually do analysis on finding ways which will help us protect our brains from hackers coming in or people using us against our will. Okay. That's where I would put is, there a, is that on your website, a place where people could... It is, and, and, and I think that it's so novel because we spent all this time developing it that there's very little, but if someone hears it right now, they just need to tell me, you know, let's, let's make it into a keyword. I want to save the world. This would be the title of the Okay. Email, All right. And I will know how to do it. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been fascinating stuff. Uh, really interesting. People should, uh, like, like, they, like you said, Google your website. And you have much more, many more videos on YouTube that are fascinating to watch. So I appreciate you taking the time with me. It was a pleasure. Thank okay. you for doing this. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Well, was your mind blown? Uh, I think it's exciting and scary all at the same time. Curing Parkinson's and deafness is amazing. Uh, but having someone hack into our brains is really scary. So definitely some ethical dilemmas with this stuff. And if you want to learn more, you can watch other interviews and talks that he's done on YouTube or click the link in the show notes for his website. And there's a lot of information on there as well. Uh, if you enjoyed this interview, make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen or watch if you're on YouTube. And that way you won't miss any future episodes. Uh, you can also follow me on social media. And of course, your likes, comments and shares on all this stuff will help support the show. And finally, if you have a couple extra minutes, you can write me a review on Apple Podcasts and that will help people find the show. So thank you so much for your uh, taking the time to listen and have a great rest of your day and remember to shoot for the moon.